Hi class, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, how economists think, and they tend to approach the world in a way that's different than uh, most other people, and kind of the tools and methods, and the way they think, and how they think, and how they can predict human behavior. Because with these assumptions, economists work from these very basic, kind of common sense assumptions, and come up with really complex theories, and very basic theories as well. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. First of all, a lot of uh, questions kind of come under the the umbrella of, is this a microeconomics course or a macroeconomics course, and, and how does this fit? Well, this course is basically, is both, short to shorten the answer, uh, mostly micro, we will address some macro, and the question is, well, what's the difference? Well, it's kind of just like it comes in the name, micro, macro, micro is going to be looking at the small parts of the economy, and macro is going to be looking at the overall big picture. So a bit more specifically, uh, microeconomics is going to look at firms, which is a fancy uh, word for businesses, and then households. So that would be an individuals or actually a household itself, how they make decisions. So maybe the decision of McDonald's, do they want to come out with a new type of hamburger or does Ford want to produce another truck? That would come under the, the umbrella of micro, specifically a firm. Uh, households, that might be something along the lines of, uh, do you want to go to college? Or if so, which college should you go to? How much uh, student loan should you take out? Stuff like that. So micro kind of looks on the, on the smaller level. Macro, however, is on a much larger level. And they're going to be looking at basically an entire economy, for instance, the U.S. economy or the, Calif the state of California economy, and looking at its health measures. Is it healthy? Uh, do we have a high degree of something that's unhealthy, such as unemployment. We don't want that. We have very high unemployment right now. Uh, do we have high inflation? We want to keep that moderate. Uh, are we growing? Hopefully we're growing as well. So macro is going to look at the whole economy and also looks at international trade. How do we, do we have a trade deficit with China? And how does that tie, uh, tie into that? Exchange rate, stuff like that. The analogy, um, it's kind of cheesy, but the idea of the forest and the trees. Essentially, you want to know both the trees and the forest. The trees is essentially micro, and then forest is macro. And understanding both sides will allow you to appreciate the world of economics even better. Certain uh, assumptions that economists make, uh, we're going to talk about here on this slide, uh, specifically the idea of self-interest. Self-interest is not selfishness. Some people think uh, they're, they're synonyms. They're not you are not being selfish if you are being self-interested. And let me explain. It is not the same as selfish. Uh, being selfish is kind of up to uh, a moral and ethical viewpoint that economists don't address. Self-interested means you are going to follow your own interests, whatever they may be. So if it's in your interest to go and walk the shortest distance across the parking lot to your car, you are going to do that. Uh, if you go and uh, you're going to choose to take a circuitous route and enjoy the parking lot, that's in your interest to do that as well. There's no right answer. Uh, some people go and they, they get a bit offended and they go, whoa, wait, wait, are you telling me that Mother Teresa was self-interested? And I would respond to that, yes, she was. She was definitely not selfish by any of our moral standards, but somebody like moral, uh, Mother Teresa was definitely self-interested because her self-interest was to help people, and that's what she spent a lot of time doing, serving the poor, stuff like that. So it's not... a uh, it's not an insult to call somebody self-interested. It's just a statement of fact. We assume, the second point here, is that people assume uh, rational behavior. And essentially, behavior that looks rational uh, is rational, and behavior that it looks irrational, in fact, is rational at times, which is a bit strange. Sometimes we go and we look at something and we say, well, that's, why would somebody do that? But an economist is going to go take a look and say, actually, it makes a lot of sense why somebody would act uh, in that way. Sometimes you'll see people, if you ever heard of somebody that goes and, like, for instance, burns their own home down, why would you do that? Well, what if you had an insurance policy where you were going to get a lot of money from your home and nobody was going to catch you? Maybe it made a lot of sense for that person to burn their house down. So it's actually rational, in a sense, if the incentives are correct, for someone to burn their house down. Just a small example, but you get the idea. In addition... Uh, people uh, are going to work with models. We're going to work a lot with models in this course. This has nothing to do with uh, kind of male or female models, something like uh, Abercrombie or whatever. Uh, it has to do with how do we go and explain human behavior uh, traditionally through a graph, 
uh, is the way that we're going to look at it. The first graph we'll take a look at is supply and demand. The idea in these models is uh, Keteris Paribus, which I have the an N there, which is not good there. Uh, it's spelled correctly down here. Uh, Keteris Paribus is basically you take one variable and you change it. You hold everything else constant and you don't change it. And you see what the result is. The idea here is if you go and change everything at the same time or you change multiple variables, you can't see the effect of that variable. So it's a very simple assumption that you go and you say, uh, what will happen uh, if you change one thing? For example, let's say you go and you're great in this course right now, you got a C, you're at 75%. Holding other, other, all other things equal, Keteris Paribus, right? What will happen to your grade in the course if you study uh, an additional hour each night for this course? Well, what will happen? Your grade will increase, right? Makes sense. What happens? Uh, you daydream more than you typically do in class. Well, holding all other things class, uh, constant, more likely your grade's going to go down. You join a sport team or you get a girlfriend or something, they take away time. There goes your grade, it's going down. And maybe your mom goes and threatens to take away your car and cell phone. Oh, man. I'm going to go study more. So holding all other things con constant, that would allow your grade to either go up or go down. Uh, the what ifs, well, what if this and what if that? Those are legitimate questions, but you need to ask those uh, only one, changing one variable at a time. Because if you change multiple variables, then it just throws off uh, the assumption because then you don't know which variable had uh, the impact on your change behavior. Economists are kind of sometimes known as, as devious people and kind of known as a little bit cold and dry and sometimes even boring. Uh, this because economists basically are known for making positive statements, which means they make very objective style statements. They make statements that are uh, just stating the way things are. A positive statement is stating the way stuff is. A normative is subject to norms. And by norms, I essentially mean societal norms and opinion. So a positive statement is completely objective, unopinionated, and a normative statement is some, somewhat subjective. You may agree with that more normative statement, but a normative statement is still an opinion. So let's go through a little exercise here. Is this a positive or normative statement? If rent controls are imposed, vacancy rates will fall. Um, that's basically a fact. That's just the way, it's the way something is going to happen. So you would call that a positive statement. Uh, the rich are currently being taxed too much. Well, you're making an opinion there, so that's going to be an normative statement. You may agree with that, but that's an opinion. The government should raise the minimum wage. That's also a normative statement because you're making an opinion. If it could be a bit different, uh, if the government may raise the minimum wage, the uh, employment figures would change by this much, that could possibly be a positive statement. We should increase spending on NASA. That would also be a normative statement because that's also an opinion. Uh, when the price of a product increases, people tend to buy less of that product. That's just a statement of the way life works. That's kind of a fact, right? So that would be a positive statement. So I hope you kind of have a bit of an idea of the difference between a positive and a normative statement. Now, the zoo activity that we did in class, which is kind of a silly, fun activity. You get to go and create your virtual zoo. Uh, you have to go and make decisions. And the reason I did that, and I didn't just do that uh, because I wanted to fulfill your childhood fantasy of building your own zoo and having gorillas in your backyard or whatever, is this exhibits several laws of economics, specifically the law of scarcity. You can go, and you are limited in some form by your zoo. Specifically, I believe we had 20 acres on here. And you had unlimited wants because you want your zoo to be the awesomest zoo ever and have all the creatures and the snow cone machine and the rock climbing wall. And yet you had to make decisions. So some questions to go through. Why did you not choose every type of exhibit? Well, that first one, you, you literally couldn't. You were constrained by the, the area of land. Maybe your cost is more realistic. So you just couldn't. That's the world we live in. We can't have everything, right? Uh, likely, if you looked at your animals, why did you not just have a zoo full of predators or primates? You probably decided, I need to have a bit of this, a bit of that. I want my zoo to appeal to all people so I can get the maximum amount of people in there. This is the idea of trade-offs, right? Trade-offs is another big concept in economics where you have to go and you have to say, in order to get something, you have to give up something. If in order to get some monkeys, I might have to give up a lion. Why did you choose one exhibit over another? Uh, maybe that was to increase 
uh, your revenue. Maybe just because you thought it was awesome. Maybe you said, oh, we need a place to eat for the people. Uh, I can't just have all animals. So you had to make another form of a trade-off. And an uh, interesting question here is, which was the last exhibit to make the cut? Which one did you essentially probably value the least that you put there in the last second? So these are just some principles to consider, and I hope you have a better understanding of how economists think, and this will give you a good understanding for the rest of the semester of how to think, and maybe you're kind of the way you're thinking and approaching a problem is going to be a bit different now.